Hi everyone, welcome to another video with Katie Shelf Life. This is the video I've been talking about for, it feels like a month or more. Finally happening, it's our journal, diary, book, chat, book recommendations with a general theme of diaries and journals and it's finally happening. We have a cold coffee today and we've got our stack of books um, underneath it. I wanted to start off with fiction. Um, there's more books in this and I just think that it's a great way to kind of get started on this. Um, first up is The Forbidden Notebook. I've talked about this in my February wrap up as well as my, there's a reading blog for it. So I go into way more detail about it, but it's basically the importance of personal narrative as a means of discovering our own inner world, the rediscovery of one's former self um, and how having a notebook can make you have all these amazing realizations about yourself. And sometimes they're kind of scary and um, maybe make you uncomfortable. Our narrator is just dis rediscovering herself in her early 40s and realizing that she has so much life left to live. And she's the way her life is looking is not matching with the way she wants to live. It's basically just the the idea that this notebook is forbidden, she should not have purchased the notebook, and I go into that in the vlog, but also that our, um, our narrator, Valeria, she is constantly hiding this notebook from her family. She keeps it a secret. It is becomes addictive to her to write in this. It is forbidden in many ways, and in many ways, the things she discovers about herself and she feels are almost forbidden thoughts as well. It segues really nicely into the Neapolitan Quartet, specifically the second book in the quartet, The Story of a New Name. We all know that I was going to bring up the quartet at some point in this video, but both of these books feel, I feel like they really go well together for many reasons. They are both translated from the Italian and by Anne Goldstein, she translated both of these, but they are also about Italian women, girls, growing up, living post-World War II. And Elena Ferrante, sorry, here I was stomping around. Elena Ferrante was heavily influenced by Suspedes. So these books are in great conversation with each other. They're tackling a lot of similar ideas while being obviously very, very different. So going into this, I don't wanna give any spoilers away for this book because um, it's a quartet. Rough intro into this quartet. We follow the friendship between two girls, Lenu and Leela, growing up in Naples. Lenu is our narrator for the four books. Both girls are extremely intelligent. However, Lenu has the chance to pursue her education while Leela drops out of school after elementary school to help her family's shoe business. And she ends up marrying someone very wealthy in the town that causes her to be out of poverty and her family. Um, but obviously the financial stability with that comes a not great marriage, um, an abusive and toxic marriage. In the second novel, we follow the two girls during their late teens and early 20s. And I'm gonna try and give zero spoilers for this, but Leo's situation changes and eventually um, financial stability changes abruptly. And Lenu is off studying. She's getting her degree. She's in college. She is pursuing education, which Lilo was never given the opportunity to pursue for various reasons. And Lila gives Lenu a box full of her writing that she's been keeping um, since she was a child. They are extremely detailed journal entries. Both girls have been really determined to flee the lives they grew up in. Ever Leela has been in, unable to escape and has instead kept everything internalized by writing everything down. And I think the reason why, there's many reasons why this one's my favorite in the quartet, but it's an extremely emotional point in the story. And it's just one that really stuck with me. And it's why I wanted to include this book because it's not the whole point of the book. It's not what revolves, like that doesn't revolve around this book or this story, but there's something about it that just really just, the fact that while she couldn't have the life she wanted or had hoped for, she gets to see her friend have that and she trusts her with all of these writings that she has kept meticulously throughout her whole life. It is her means of documenting and writing herself down and making sure that some part of her is preserved. So I just wanted to pause here really quick and say um, thank you for watching this video. Um, if you've been enjoying watching my videos or you're enjoying watching this one, if you could like it, that would be amazing. It really helps out this channel and it helps it grow. And I'm having such a wonderful time making these videos and sharing with you. And yeah, if you could just like them, that'd be amazing. And I just wanted to put that in there now and say thank you. And we're gonna move on to the rest of the books. 
Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. I'm about to do a reread of this and might do a vlog for it. Um, it's incredible. You don't need to read the whole um, trilogy if you want to. That's awesome. I think it is great and definitely worth your time. Um, even if you're not into science fiction, I think this book is doing a lot of things really, really well that you don't have to be a science fiction fan to enjoy. This novel is structured as a journal and it's being written by our unnamed narrator, simply called The Biologist. Um, as a reader, you're reading her journal, this group going in to explore this area called area x it has no boundaries no one really knows where it came from the origin origins of it are unknown and there's been i believe it's like 13 or 11 other expeditions to go in to see what can be found either you don't come back or you come back not okay most people do not come back and so she is sent in with an, a group of women. As we're reading this, like she is extremely unreliable because the space that she is in is unreliable. So what we are reading in her journal, it seems absolutely unreal. And we really can't tell if what we're reading is real or has happened or if she did witness any of this. The team that is sent in is not allowed to take anything technological. They're each given a journal. And I will read the description that Vandermeer writes of this journal because I think it is just a really great description of a journal and I just when you read it you feel as if you're holding it. It's lightweight but nearly indestructible with waterproof paper, a flexible black and white cover, and the blue horizontal line for writing and the red line to the left to mark the margin. And I just think that's a great description and this book is absolutely phenomenal. I'm gonna do a reread, probably gonna do a vlog and we're gonna have a little chitty chat about it but it's great. One of my favorite books of all time. So next up, we have A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ozeki. Since I haven't read it, I don't feel like I have as great of a reflection to give on it, but I definitely wanted to include it because a journal is very important in this. So I'm gonna kind of read a bit of the synopsis. Yo, 16 year old now has decided there's only one escape from her aching loneliness and her classmates bullying. But before she ends her life, she plans to document the life of her great grandmother, a Buddhist nun who's lived more than a century. A diary is now's only solace. We meet Ruth, a novelist living on a remote island who discovers a collection of artifacts washed ashore in a Hello Kitty lunchbox, possibly debris from the devastating 2011 tsunami. As the mystery of its contents unfolds, Ruth is pulled into the past, into now's drama and her unknown fate, and forward into her own, into her own future. It explores the relationship between writer and reader, past and present, fact and fiction, and I just think it sounds like a fantastic novel and I really should make it a priority. But another book that I have not read that's been on my shelf for quite a while and I know is quite popular is The Golden Notebook by Doris Lessing. Anna, our narrator, is a writer, um, a very successful novel who now keeps four notebooks. In one with a black cover, she reviews the African experience of her earlier year. In a red one, she records her political life, her disillusionment with communism, in a yellow one, she writes a novel in which the heroine relives part of her own experience. And in the blue one, she keeps a personal diary. And Anna throughout the book is trying to bring together all four notebooks into one that she will call the golden notebook. Another favorite book of mine is The Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli. It was like one of the first books I thought about when I thought about doing this video. It's the most non-traditional of diary keeping. This book is um, about a husband and wife that are taking a road trip from New York City to the Southwest with their two children, um, a boy and a girl. The marriage between the father and the mother is falling apart throughout this road trip. It is very evident that they will not last and this is like their last trip kind of all together. A couple of documents sound for a living. They're working on a project to capture the soundscape of New York City. So they spend every day recording and they have an archive full of fragments of strangers' lives. The novel is framed around the archive of the journey. The family has brought boxes with them labeled with Roman numerals. The husband's boxes hold research on Geronimo. One box belongs to the wife. It contains her notes, maps, readings, photos, reports, and newspaper clippings. And then the children each have an empty box where they're allowed to collect throughout the journey. The boy in the story is obsessed with taking photos um, and so he's filling his box with photos. There are Polaroids throughout and we are meant to believe that, you know, they're from the little boy that he took throughout their journey. 
And I just really love that the children are given each a box to collect fragments, to collect, I think the girl collects like rocks and sand and um, the boy is collecting actual imagery, like image memories, because he's more aware than, he's older than the girl. So he's a little more aware that there's something off about his mom and dad, that something's not quite right. That both children can feel it, but he is very much in tune with that. So he's taking every chance he can get to photograph these things, to hold on to them. And it's just really, really beautiful in the fact that they just store all of these memories and artifacts in these boxes that are in their car on this journey. That's an archive of the trip, but it's also an archive of this last moment together as a family of four, a collection of memories to hold on to. Really engaging story of how we document our experiences and how we remember things that matter to us the most. Okay, so now we're done with the fiction section. I'm going to move on to personal narrative. There are mainly books that have to do with the practice of writing and like the craft of writing ourselves down. Memoir narrative. First up is going to be Bodywork by Melissa Phoebos. This is a mix of memoir and the emotional and psychological work of writing our most intimate selves. Um, if you've ever read any of uh, Melissa's memoirs, you know that she has had quite an experience in life. She has gone through a lot of different things and she writes about them in absolute brutal honesty in her memoirs and she kind of retackles that in here. How we can explore and write about the relationships that have formed us. How do we tackle writing about our own bodies through desire and trauma? How do we write about the hard things for ourselves, and even when we know others may read it? Being honest with yourself and being honest with your own story and telling your story. I can say it's like a how-to, but it's definitely like a, if you're interested in craft, this is a great book on craft and writing and memoir, but I also found it very beneficial as someone who is not a writer, who is not looking to write a memoir, will make you want to go read her other work as well because she is truly exceptional in the art of memoir. So next up we have The Art of Memoir by Mary Carr. Um, and this Carr is breaking down the elements of great literary memoir, writing about her favorite memoirs and writers and all the things that they're doing really, really well, um, which is exciting because it'll make you wanna add a ton of things to your TBR list. It's breaking open our concepts of memory and identity, which is very much what most of us are trying to excavate when we're journaling is digging our memories, processing our memories, discussing the power of reflecting on our own past, which is really, really valuable when it comes to journaling. Um, if you're looking for a book that forces you to go beyond the confessional diary form and into memoir, memoir territory, this is great. They're nonfiction picks um, that are very much, they are diaries and they are journals, like they are written as that. Two are by the same author. We probably already know what's coming because um, I have talked about them previously. I have not read them yet. They are going to be my summer reads because they just feel like summer reads. And both of them, or the two that I'm going to talk about are both by Mae Sarton. Mae Sarton has written multiple, wrote multiple journals. And these two are the two that I've recently purchased. We've got Journal of a Solitude and Plant Dreaming Deep. We're going to start with Journal of a Solitude. So this is a year of journal entries. They're honest accounts of Sarton's solitary life, writing about her own aging, isolation, solitude, love and relationships, her love of nature, the struggles of a creative life, what it means to be alone, caring for yourself, your home and your garden and living a quiet life. Sounds lovely and very introspective. Other journal, Plant Dreaming Deep. One is specifically about Sarton turning her dream house into a home and the process of her creating a space for herself to live and breathe, create and nurture. Very much about her garden and growing that. Just sound really great. I've heard nothing but great things about Sarton's writing and I just love that these are both journals. Next up, I've talked about this. It's The Folded Clock by Heidi Julevitz. It's a chronicle of Heidi's life, her daily life as a 40-something woman, wife, mother, and writer. It's an honest, unglamorous look into the author's life. It's oftentimes boring, which sounds really bad, but it's boring because not every entry is like this grand thing that's happening. It's very much just life, and life is not exciting every day. Life can be really boring sometimes. And Heidi's not trying to embellish. She is just trying to tell you 
this is what my day was like, this is what happened, here are some interactions I had, here are some things happening with my family, and there's a real beauty in that. And um, She has a memoir coming out soon, and the publisher reached out to me to see if I wanted an arc, and I'm like, um, did I make it? A little bit. But yeah, I'm very excited to get an arc of it because the memoir sounds fantastic. Next, I've got the Unabridged Journals of Sylvia Plath. These are a collection of Plath's last 12 years of her life. They're her personal and literary struggles. I won't go too much into this because I feel like there's not a lot to say except that it is her journals. So her personal life, her writing journey, her relationships, her mental health. Um, I have wanted to pick this up for a while and I've been putting it off. I think I want to make this like a year long project. So this is the art chat part. <laughs> we all knew this was coming because I definitely associate art making and sketchbooks with the act of, sorry, here is moving, with the art of journaling. I recently started like traditionally journaling, like writing actual words into a notebook in the more traditional sense that we think of writing in diaries. I remember really beating myself up over it because I felt like I had missed so much of my 20s in not writing in a journal. Um, the experiences of college, of relationships, of failed relationships, of discovering who I was, of, you know, having the experiences of being, you know, in your 20s. Even in my teens, I was like, why didn't I keep a journal? I did when I was a kid. Why didn't I keep that up? And then I realized that I had been using a sketchbook for years. My whole teen years, 20s, through college and grad school, I always had a sketchbook and this is where I would jot down ideas for paintings. I would sketch ideas. I would take notes. I would make lists. I would test color combinations. I would even write little notes, dotted notes being like the feel, what I was thinking about, what the painting was about. And thinking back on that, I realized like that was definitely a form of journaling. That was a form of documentation. I have stacks of sketchbooks and just because I wasn't writing in a journal in the traditional sense, those on a page didn't make it any less of a diary of my thoughts and experiences. I look back at paintings that I made through my teens and my 20s, um, the ones I still have and didn't paint over or something. Because those are definitely in dialogue with myself. I can see parts of myself when I made that painting. I can see who I was at 22, 23. I can remember what I was feeling, what I was dealing with. I can recall, they're like a, distil a distillation of ideas and emotions. I can look at any painting I've created and recall the memory or the emotion that I was trying to evoke or was trying to express to get out. And while I wasn't getting it out on paper and writing it, I was getting it out with color, with texture, with a brush, with a pencil, with charcoal. Um, I was getting it out in other ways. That in itself is a journal. When you're finished with the painting or the piece of art, it is a still image. It is something you can look at. And every mark to me is a word, is a sentence is an emotion, is a memory. And I just find that really, really exciting. It sort of segues us into um, the last book I want to talk about. I think the greatest example of what I'm talking about, if we want to put it in a book form, is going to be The Diary of Frida Kahlo. This is Kahlo's illustrated journal documenting the last, documenting the last 10 years of her life. It contains her thoughts, poems, and dreams. Um, many reflecting on her difficult relationship with her husband, the artist Diego Rivera. It's a mix whoop, It's a mix of watercolor illustrations intersected with her own writing on love and politics. It's a reflection of her creativity through pain, both physical and emotional. Um, it's a really beautiful book. I'm really, really happy that I own this. I think it is the best example. I'm sure there are many others, but I think this is an excellent example of an artist's journal sketchbook, diary, all those things. Um, it's really, really quite beautiful. Her writing just mixed in. You can even see like her processing paintings that she was wanting to create. Um, there's a lot of imagery that pops up in many of her paintings of that. This is a form of documenting. It's not straightforward words on a page. It is mixed with drawings, with doodles, with random thoughts and words and 
color and yeah, it's a really lovely book. I'm very happy that I own this, but it's the book that I wanted to end with. I'm sure there are tons of other books that I didn't include on this list. Just a few I wanted to highlight. So if you have any recommendations, please drop them in the comments because I would love to see that. I know um, the community here would like to see that as well. And I will probably add them to my list because I'm always looking for more books with this theme. We'll see you in the next video. Um, remember if you like this video to give it a thumbs up, that really helps out. And just remember to take care of yourself and to always be kind and I will see you in the next video. Bye.